So uh, I'm presenting uh, improving prediction of low prior clinical events with simultaneous general patient state representation. My name is Matthew Barron, and I worked on this project with my advisor, uh, Milos Hauschkrist. So just to introduct, uh, introduce uh, low prior events, uh, prediction of low prior events is common in the clinical setting. So the sparsity of an event often coincides with the severity, which makes these tasks uh, imperative to proceed. So low prior likelihood in this context, I'm talking about around 1% or less of the positive classes relative to the negative. These low prior tasks can be rare uh, because the event is either rare itself or the definition of the problem. So we can take the uh, context of one of our tasks, an initial onset of sepsis. So one, we're only looking at the initial onset. So it's going to be defined at most once for a sequence. And then it's also going to be somewhat constrained in terms of the, uh, the uh, interval uh, segmentation. So here we're doing it every six hours. Uh, but you can imagine even further, if we were to go ahead and cut that down to three hours, now we've uh, increased our number of negatives relative to that single event. So previous handling of these methods uh, for low, uh, low prior clinical event prediction, uh, one way is to just take the supervi uh, supervised task as is. Um, but the problem with this is it can lead to a poor learning and generalizability because of the coverage of the data present. And the other thing too is generally there's a large number of predictors which would require a lower dimensional representation, um, but given the you know, less coverage, it's gonna be hard to learn a, a solid representation from that. The next thing we can do is we can apply transfer learning from some similar tasks, which does require the fact that we would have similar tasks to use. Um, and this is going to require an initial step of pre-training the model with similar clinical tasks. But the pre-trained tasks may be misaligned to the specific low prior clinical task, which means that we've uh, trained, uh, pre-trained a model, and then we have a model that we're using those pre-trained weights and we may find a worse local optima. So the other thing we can do is we can uh, create a general patient state representation. So using a, a low or finding a low dimensional representation of the patient based on some reconstruction or forecasting of some generic clinical tasks or observations. And this is done a, a lot using um, you know, matrix factorization methods and neural network architectures. Um, and this kind of falls into that same place of uh, pipelining where we're training one model first, which may not be aligned to our low prior clinical task that we're um, you know, looking at as our objective. So our proposal is to learn both the low prior event and the generic clinical tasks simultaneously in a shared architecture with a shared objective function. So our, our goal is to improve the performance specifically of the learned low prior clinical event uh, by modeling it with this shared general patient state representation. Uh, for this, in general, uh, when looking at low prior clinical events, uh, AUPRC is a better indicator of performance, so that will be kind of our gold standard when we're evaluating. And simultaneous learning does have roots in other areas. So supervised LDA uh, is, is one space where we combine the objective functions of topic learning and a supervised task. And in this case, it's used to essentially um, support better topics through some uh, particular supervised task. So in this paper, we are going to explore this framework using specifically recurrent neural networks uh, with LSTM units. And, and this is just because of the performance in the past uh, works relative to using this particular architecture and how they've worked well in the clinical setting. So next we're gonna talk about the problem statement and methodology. So first we can consider some uh, function F where we are going to go ahead and uh, learn some predict, uh, predictive low prior clinical task, why uh, based off of some set of inputs. So like I was saying before, for our low prior predictors, we want a, a low dimensional representation uh, to reduce some of those predictors and, and find a, a better performance. So instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, learn some low prior representation or low dimensional uh, representation S of T uh, where Y of T will be a function of S of T. And so then to further define S of T, it needs to be derived from somewhere, which is going to be our input space. And since we're specifically working with a time series model, it'll be defined based off of past observations. So then we can go ahead and consider this uh, auxiliary learning task, which are generic clinical tasks. And this is going to be used to further support the learning of our general patient state representation for our supervised uh, predictive task. So in our case, we can uh, consider this function G prime where we have some uh, the same uh, shared representation uh, S of T that's going to be forecasting some future generic clinical tasks. 
Uh, since our modeling architecture is an RNN, we can also reduce uh, the space of how we define S of T such that it's only defined off of the observations and the prior state. So uh, thus, uh, from this, we have an architecture that supports uh, simultaneous learning of a low prior clinical task F prime with this auxiliary generic clinical task G prime, which is going to be shared through our, uh, our shared um, general patient state representation S of T. So uh, from this, when we're looking at our architecture, it's going to produce two different uh, outputs. One is going to be our low prior task, and the other is going to be our generic clinical tasks that are forecasted. Uh, the shared state, like I was stating before, is just going to be a function of the um, input uh, observation at time t and the prior state. So we can see here from our model architecture, the input is then going to be applied to a linear layer into our LSTM with uh, an additional linear layer with a rectified linear unit as our uh, final layer before the output. The generic clinical task prediction can also be further uh, indexed uh, based off of the task R and the class C. So if this is our set of tasks R, uh, and then for a particular R, we have a set of classes C, we can use this superscript in order to go ahead and uh, index that further. So in order to share uh, the architecture and the, the learning through our objective function, we're going to have to define two different uh, error uh, functions. So we have one based off of our low prior clinical task and the other that's defined based off of our generic clinical uh, task, which are both uh, cross entropy. And then this loss is going to be jointly evaluated uh, into our low prior GCT weighting scheme. So this uh, weighting scheme is going to be a hyperparameter P that's going to throttle the information between the uh, low prior uh, task and our generic clinical tasks. So you can imagine P, since it's a hyperparameter, it's fixed. If we were to fix it to one, uh, we're only going to be utilizing the low prior clinical task in terms of the loss. And likewise, uh, we can go ahead and fix it to uh, zero, which would mean that we're only going to be utilizing the generic clinical tasks. And then for the purposes of this, uh, you know, we're expecting to see some sort of blending in between where P would not be you know, one or zero, but some continuous value in between. So let's take a look at the experimental setup. Uh, we are using the MIMIC-3 data set, uh, looking at adult ICU patients, um, and then taking 191 clinical and lab vital signs, which are going to be discretized to normal, abnormal, high, and low. Uh, this is all based off of a, a set of um, knowledge base uh, publications. For the targets, we have three. Uh, it's mort uh, mortality, uh, uh, norepinephrine administration, and then the initial onset of sepsis. And the prediction horizons are 72 hour, two hour, and six hour. Uh, in this column, you can see our likelihoods or our priors for the positive class. Uh, the, all of these will be segmented at the prediction horizon uh, time, with the exception of mortality, which it's going to be segmented at 24 hours instead of 72. For the generic clinical tasks, there's 189 lab and vital signs, which are these same variables that we're forecasting, with a prediction horizon that matches the low prior task. So the uh, prediction horizon for the model, uh, when we're looking at the generic clinical task for sepsis, is going to be six hours along with uh, the actual low prior task. Uh, this, in general, is going to be two to three classes per task, uh, but you know, is, is mostly three. For the validation criteria, uh, we are going to use AUROC for both the hyperparameter selection uh, and early stopping. So next, we'll take a look at the baseline models. So uh, first off, um, in, in general, uh, we, we try to maintain the fact that the base structure of these models is going to be the same with the same candidate layer sizes. So the RNN supervised model, which is just going to be predicting the low prior task is our first baseline. And you can see here that the only difference between this and our proposed model is that the uh, additional parameters that are used to predict, uh, to forecast that um, generic clinical task. We have two other baselines. Those are our general patient state representation baselines. So the first one is a simple embedding model that, again, is going to be using the same general structure to go ahead and forecast the uh, generic clinical tasks. And then there's some additional learning that will be applied in order to align it to the low prior task. And then the second or the third baseline, I should say, is the RNN residual, which is using the same embedding model, but it applies some residual layers to better align itself to the predictive task. So next we'll look at our two proposed models. So the first one we've already uh, examined in the methodology section. And the second one is going to be a similar model, but the only difference is there's one additional uh, 
or there's additional isolated small linear layers uh, assigned to each particular uh, task. So uh, the next thing we need to consider then is the uh, loss weighting hyperparameter, um, which was given previously, that value P. Uh, so this is selected based on the validation A, U, R, O, C. So first, the structural hyperparameters, uh, which are the layer sizes, are learned uh, with the fixed loss weighting. So we select these first, and we're setting it uh, just at a fixed value of 0 0.9. And then the loss weighting is selected based on whatever the selected structure hyperparameters are for those proposed models. Uh, so you can see here, uh, using the validation uh, data where we're making this selection, this was the iterating over the various loss weights of P uh, at a range of 0 to 1 at um, steps of 0.1. And we, uh, we're looking at just the mortality prediction in this case. And then this loss weighting table gives us what was selected based off of the validation AURC for each model and task. And so just to note here that uh, 1.0 and 0, 0.0 were considered when we were moving through, but uh, based off the validation AURC, uh, we, we selected a, you know, a blend, although obviously heavily more towards the low prior task than the uh, general clinical task, which I think is expected. So. Next, let's uh, look at the evaluation studies. So we have two studies uh, using AUPRC performance. We also look at AURC, but this is just to make sure that uh, one, uh, one metric is not being sacrificed for the other. Uh, so the first one is just taking the average AUPRC performance over the full data sets. And the second one is actually two splits of uh, ablation studies where we're going to go ahead and reduce the training and validation sets based on the prior positive class and the uh, sampled sequences. So the first one, we're going to drop the number of prior positive samples and then, or uh, positive samples. And then the other, we're going to just reduce the overall set. So why do this? We wanna examine the uh, model's ability to learn in increasingly challenging and low prior uh, and sparse data settings. Uh, for this as well, the test set is going to remain constant as compared to the learning at each reduction rate because, you know, we want to compare this, um, you know, at, at various reduced rates. So looking at the results, uh, these two models over here in the blue and green are our proposed and the others are our baselines. This dashed line here is the uh, prior likelihood of the model, so the number or the, yeah, the likelihood of positive classes. And you can see that in general, on average, uh, our uh, proposed models are performing better than the um, baseline models, and they're performing better than the um, uh, prior, which should be expected because that's a weak baseline. Uh, you know, it's not, it's only marginally better in this case, but you can see there, there's a pretty good gain on norepi and a, you know, small gain on mortality. Uh, the other thing to note here, right, is the AERC performance is similar across these models. Um, and that was just, again, to reiterate that we weren't, weren't sacrificing a single metric over another. Uh, this is included specifically in the paper. Uh, the next thing is looking at our ablation study. So we have our two different ablation studies. The one is the reduction of the percent prior, and the other one is the reduction of the data. 100% uh, corresponds to using the full data set. And then uh, likewise, we, we drop it by 20% each time evaluating all the 20. Um, and, and that corresponds to the, the reduction of this data set. The uh, solid lines here are representing our proposed models and the dashed lines here are our baselines. And so what we're seeing is our, based off of our prior and our sample reductions for two out of three tasks, we had pretty strong consistency and performance up to a 60% reduction rate, uh, you know, even further for some of the models. And in general, the, uh, we had better performance uh, AUPRC wise on those two out of three tasks. And then the bottom line here is that the simultaneous learning uh, generally performed better under a more challenging learning condition. So finally, we can look at our conclusions. So simultaneous learning of low prior clinical events and the general uh, generic clinical tasks can provide an improvement into that predictive performance. And this is demonstrated based off of our proposed models outperforming the baselines in most tasks and studies. Our proposed models uh, were also resilient to that low prior and sample reduced setting, which is going to demonstrate the performance of consistency despite the fact that we have lower, lower data available for training and validation. And then I, I think another key thing to note here, right, is we did focus on using RNN LSTMs and we did focus on a particular, um, you know, forecasting method instead of reconstruction. Uh, at that same time too, there's no reason to 
you know, think that we couldn't also apply the same, um, the same structure in a, a different context. So same simultaneous learning in a, in a new context. And that's all I have and uh, thank you.